I'm Tamara Hedges. I'm the executive director at the University of California, Riverside Palm Desert Center. It's an honor to have Lauren Farr speak with us this evening about the effects of urban noise and light pollution on avian communities. A reminder that this event is being recorded. You can see and hear us, but we can't see or hear you, I promise. So it's okay to have that second piece of pie for dessert. No one will know, at least we won't know. I encourage you to use the chat feature to let us know where you're zooming in from and any other tidbits you'd like to share with us. We will be taking questions from you, our audience, after the presentation. Feel free to put those questions in the Q&A at any time. And Colin Barrows is a UCR Palm Desert volunteer, Cal naturalist, climate steward, and serves on our Wild Coachella Planning Committee. Colin will be managing our Q&A this evening. So thank you very much, Colin. As an institution physically located in Southern California, we at UCR would like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water and air, the Kawia, the Tongva, the Sueno and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting space is home to many indigenous peoples from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on these homelands. Please take a moment to acknowledge and reflect on the native, aboriginal, and indigenous peoples of your area from which you are physically joining us today. Please put that in the chat if you'd like. And if you are unfamiliar with the original and current caretakers of the land, water, and air from your area, we highly recommend you take the time to self-educate, reflect, and listen to these histories. Before we get started, I have some additional messages of gratitude. Thank you very much, our UCR Palm Desert Center partners. I see some of you here this evening. Thank you for your generous and unwavering support. You're enabling us to continue our free community programming, allowing us to all learn, grow, and discover together. Lastly, but definitely not least, a big thank you to our behind the scenes team of Kelly Irwin, Maggie Downs, Agam Patel, and Amy O'Neill. Now I'd like to turn it over to a very special person to introduce our speaker, Elizabeth Ogren Erickson. Take it away, Elizabeth. Thank you, Tamara. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Elizabeth Ogren Erickson. I am a University of California, Desert, Sands, and Sky Islands Certified California Naturalist, a UC Climate Steward, and a grateful UCR Palm Desert partner. I am grateful for the excellent exhibits, educational lectures, and events that the UCR Palm Desert Center provides free of charge. I invite you to become a partner and join Bob and I in supporting programs such as this evening's Wild Coachella Lecture Series. You'll find information in the chat on how to join, and we thank you and all of our Palm Desert partners for your support. I have the honor of introducing our speaker. First, a special thank you to California naturalist, climate steward, Tracy Bartlett, who suggested Lauren as a speaker. Thank you, Tracy. Now to introduce Lauren Farr. Lauren is an ornithologist and a PhD student at North Carolina State University with a focus on fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology. Her current research focuses on the federally endangered red cockaded woodpecker. She is an engaging science communicator and has presented to Georgia Audubon and Hog Island Audubon. She writes and uh, shares communications with Cincinnati Zoo, National Geographic, BBC Wildlife and eBird. Uh, Lauren is an associate editor for North Carolina Sea Grant's award-winning magazine Coast Watch, as well as an editorial advisory board member for the Wildlife Society's magazine titled The Wildlife Professional. 
She is a recipient of many awards, including a scholarship grant from North Carolina Wildlife Federation and funding from Alongside Wildlife Foundation. Lauren will discuss the dramatic effect that anthropogenic, in other words, human produced light sources have on wildlife, especially the urbanization effects of urban noise and light pollution. Take it away, Lauren. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for that lovely introduction. You have me over here flattered. Oh my gosh. Um, so first and foremost, I want to give a huge thank you to the UCR um, Palm Desert, you know, uh, team. Um, thank you for, you know, inviting me out to speak with you all this evening. Um, I'm super looking forward to this presentation. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, but I also want to thank you all from wherever you are joining from. I saw people from Florida and Wisconsin and Idaho, which I have been to Idaho. So um, I just want to thank you all for choosing to, you know, spend your evening with us. Um, so let's see, without further ado here, my screen should be shared. Can someone let me know if it's all good on your end? Looks good. Thank you, Lauren. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, so like Elizabeth had discussed tonight, we are going to be talking about the effects of urban noise and light pollution on avian communities. But before we get started, I want to sort of give you guys a little bit of background and history about myself. Um, so I graduated from Wingate University in 2019 with my bachelor's of science degree in environmental biology. From there, I, um, attended, still attending, <laughs> NC State University, um, and I received uh, my master's in fisheries, wildlife, and conservation biology in May of 2021, and I loved NC State so much that I couldn't leave just yet, so from there I decided to continue on and pursue my PhD, still in the same um, area of study, and that's where I currently am right now. So I'm joining you all from Raleigh, North Carolina. A little bit about my research. So in undergrad was when I first started out um, doing research. So I've done research in reproductive physiology. So specifically, I've looked at the effects of twin lambs on a mature ewe or their mom, <laughs> basically. Um, and then from there, I moved sort of into behavioral research. Um, I did behavioral research for about two years there, researching Chinese blue-breasted quail and analyzing their vocal harmonics um, as they physically matured. So when I first started that research, that was the research that ultimately sealed the deal for me wanting to study and learn more about birds. And I also took a wildlife management course that essentially got me interested in learning more, wanting to learn more about wildlife biology. So from there, I went to NC State University. And so for my master's work, I researched urbanization and its effects on avian survival, which is what I will be discussing with you all tonight and sort of diving into my master's work toward the end of my presentation. But currently now for my PhD, I have switched gears a little bit. Um, so still focused on climate change, but looking at nestling success in the federally endangered red cockaded woodpecker. So as Elizabeth has already explained to you, but I'll just touch on them one more time. Aside from my research, I am also heavily involved in other activities here at NC State and beyond. So I currently serve as a student representative on our department's um, diversity, equity, and inclusion committee. I am an associate editor and intern at North Carolina Sea Grant, where I write and publish articles, blog posts, help them with other, you know, side things, if you will. And um, I'm also an editorial advisory board member for the Wildlife Society um, for their magazine, The Wildlife Professional. So aside from all that, I do consider myself a freelance writer, which is where my science communication comes in. So just like I'm speaking to you all tonight, I love giving presentations and talks like this, as well as writing more about my research, about birds, about wildlife, you name it. So I have been a freelance writer for the Nature Conservancy's Cool Green Science blog. I still currently am. I've also written for BBC Wildlife, and I have contributed articles to National Geographic. So now that we got all that boring stuff out of the way, <laughs> um, I will go over with you here just a brief outline of what we will go over in this presentation this evening. So first, I will sort of start out with an overview of the urban urbanization impacts that we're seeing on species. Then I'll sort of narrow it down to an overview of noise and light impacts on species. 
Then I'll dive more specifically into light and noise pollution effects on birds, which is why you are all here this evening. But again, I feel like it's important to sort of talk about that urbanization as a whole and then sort of narrow it down to the species that we want to talk about this evening, which is birds. Then I will dive into my um, research that I did, my master's thesis on urban noise and light pollution and avian survivorship. And then last but not least, um, I have a slide in here with some resources, but there will be some links um, inserted in the chat as I'm talking as well, but I have those resources again on another slide um, just for reference. Okay, so this is actually my first time in a while giving this talk. Um, I've given this talk multiple times um, and you know, tons of organizations that I've given this talk to have absolutely loved it. Um, so I always like to start out this talk sort of setting the scene with this um, picture, if you will. So in this picture here, we see that we have a witch and we see that she is currently residing in an urban area. We see tons of houses. We see a guy that's mowing his lawn. And we see that the witch is saying to her neighbor, I remember when this was all forest. So as we could all imagine, the witch was comfortably living in the forest by herself. And then all of a sudden, here comes this land development, this massive land development, and all of these houses that have popped up around her. So as we see now currently with, you know, tons of land development that's going on around us, I drive up and down the roads every day. I see tons of, you know, houses being built and everything. So it always takes me back to this depiction, really. So um, this quote slash statistic I pulled from a study by uh, Buhang et al, which states that urbanization defined as the population shift from rural to urban areas is projected to increase by more than 3 billion people between the years of 2010 and 2050. Now, that may not seem like a lot to some people, but once we put it into perspective within those years, that's a ton of increase as it relates to urbanization. So again, just wanting to set the scene there, but as I go through this presentation, you um, will, I want to introduce these two terms to you. I may or may not um, use them. I may just stick to urban noise and light pollution because it's easier and not so much of a tongue twister. But when we get into talking about studies and research when it comes to urban noise and light pollution, you will most likely hear these two words um, and see these two words used a ton. So the first word we have is anthropogenic. So um, anthro meaning human, and basically um, stating that anthropogenic is chiefly of environmental pollution and pollutants originating in human activity. So basically this is anything that we as humans are you know, bringing on, we as humans are causing. So this is where the term anthropogenic comes in, hence the term anthropogenic noise um, or anthropogenic light pollution. And then you'll also uh, see or hear this term artificial light at night or ALON as the acronym. And this is a light source that is not naturally occurring. So a ton of research studies, when they talk about, you know, artificial light, they will use this um, term and this acronym, you know, um, a ton. But so when we talk about artificial light at night, we're talking about light that's coming um, from light sources such as illuminated buildings. They can come from our car's headlights. Um, they can come from our street lights in our neighborhoods. So this is what we mean when we talk about artificial light at night. So again, I just wanted to introduce these two terms to you all, but I think I'll just keep it basic and just say urban noise and light pollution for this evening. So I first wanna start off with discussing um, urbanization as a whole and sort of what we see um, the impacts of urbanization on different um, animal species before we get more specifically into birds. So I have pulled four different animal species here, but keep in mind that the examples that I've pulled, they can you know, be related and can factor into many other animal species, not just this one, but these are factors that we may think of as quite common when it comes to these animals in urban areas. So the first thing we have is deer. So when it comes to deer and urbanization, um, with all this land development and housing developments popping up, deer um, are you know, losing their forest habitat. So they, um, the lack of forest habitat is you know, sincerely decreasing. But don't get me wrong, deer populations are doing fairly well. Um, so they're in no like, conservation concern whatsoever. But as with any animal, um, the deer are, you know, they continue to lose much of the um, habitat that they, you know, thrive in. So deer love mature forests. They love to bed in mature forests. So you can imagine that with all of this land development coming up and all of this clear cutting, that forest is being lost. 
The next animal that I have here is a turtle. So when we think of turtles, we might think of vehicle fatalities. So turtles trying to cross the street, for example, um, when it comes to urban areas, there's a ton of you know, highways and street and streetways and passages being built in order for us to get from one place to another. And as you can imagine, wildlife you know, will have a hard time trying to cross those busy passageways. There are some states who have implemented you know, safe passageways for wildlife. Um, some states are still working towards it, but um, nevertheless, animals are continuously you know, being impacted by these busy roads and highways. I always tell people, if you ever see a turtle and you're able to help it cross the road, always help it cross in the direction that it was going, not the direction that it was coming from. The next animal that I pulled here is a raccoon, and I put supplemental feeding as an example for these guys. So in urban areas, you can imagine that the, the, the trash and the you know, accumulation of trash is very, very high. And so for some animals like raccoons, if they do find that trash, you know, and they see that that trash is easily accessible, they might as well, you know, keep coming back day after day just to feed off of our trash. And what this is doing is it's hindering these raccoons from going out and foraging, you know, themselves and finding their own food. So I always tell people, you know, get rid of your trash when you can, or, you know, keep it to a minimum, um, keep your trash cans closed, etc. And last but not least, I have pulled an ant and it represents pesticides. So one thing that people might not consider when it comes to urban areas is the use of pesticides. And so not only is the pesticides bad for the insect population, but it's also, it sort of brings on a chain reaction. So those animals like birds, for example, who rely on these insects um, are becoming impacted by the low you know, amount of insects that are being impacted by pesticides. So therefore those birds that are relying on those insects in order to feed themselves or feed their young, they can become severely impacted because of our heavy use of pesticides. So just something to keep in mind for that. And again, all these examples I pulled for these animals specifically, but they can apply to multiple species of animals when it comes to urbanization. So now I'll sort of get more narrow and talk about anthropogenic noise and artificial light at night or urban noise and light pollution and what scientists and researchers have been seeing as it comes to other species of animals. So not just birds, but other species. So one study, Simpson et al. found that anthropogenic noise increased fish mortality. So anthropogenic noise, there has been numerous studies which have um, you know, determined that Tons of anthropogenic noise is impacting marine life. So that is a huge, huge topic um, as far as um, anthropogenic noise is concerned. Another study found that frogs adapt to um, physiologically, frogs adapt to physiologically costly anthropogenic noise. That was a tongue twister. So anthropogenic noise is also impacting frogs and their frog calls, so their communication. And then last but not least, I pulled um, a bird example. So um, some studies have found that anthropogenic noise has also impacted a bird's parental behavior, their nestling growth, and their nestling oxidative stress. So a few examples that I pulled as far as anthropogenic noise is concerned. So what about artificial light at night? So here, researchers have shown that artificial light at night is impacting turtles. So turtles, they, you know, make their nests in the sand. And once those eggs hatch, they basically migrate to the ocean. There have been multiple studies which have um, shown that uh, artificial light at night is impacting these turtles migrating to the ocean safely. Another study has found that artificial light at night puts ecosystem services of bats at risk. So just like birds and their migration, which we'll talk about here, in a little bit and how light at night impacts that, it also impacts bats. And then last but not least, I pulled another bird example to get us into the birds here in a minute. Um, but some studies have found that light pollution has affected the singing behavior of American robins. So if you're interested in reading more about any of these studies, you can definitely go on Google Scholar and you know, look up anthropogenic noise or urban noise and light pollution. And a whole bunch of studies will come up on different species. But the purpose of this slide was to just show you all that noise and light impact multiple species and not just birds. But without further ado, now we'll get into the birds, which is why you are all here. So with everything that I have discussed previously, birds experience these things too. So in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna do the same thing as I did previously, but sort of go into more detail at 
with, with some studies that have looked into the effects of artificial light and anthropogenic noise on avian populations. But before I do that, I sort of want to talk about um, this thing that we call species richness when it comes to birds. So I pulled this quote again, like I had introduced earlier, um, a projected increase in urban populations by more than 3 billion people between 2010 and 2050, because again, it sets the scene for what we will be discussing here in the next few slides. So we as researchers, as ornithologists, um, like to uh, separate birds into two broad categories. So birds can either be considered a generalist species or a specialist species. So what we mean by generalist species is it's exactly like it sounds. Generalist species of birds are able to easily adapt to changes. So common generalist species would be like your northern cardinals, your American robins. Those would be sort of your generalist species that you um, would find in urban areas. So with all of these urban impacts that we're bringing in as humans, these species are easily able to adapt to them. Um, whether it be, you know, and their food, like their food sources, their habitat, it's very, very general, which is why we consider them a generalist species. Whereas on the other hand, we have um, a group of birds that we call specialist species. So these could be, I always love using the wrens, Carolina and house wrens as an example of specialist species since they are cavity nesting birds. Um, they thrive off of insects, et cetera. So you can imagine that although we might find these birds still in urban areas and they might be doing fairly well, they would most likely have a harder time sort of adapting to everything that's going on with urbanization, especially when it comes to their nesting habitats and food sources, if you will. So with all this to say, um, I put in this, this saying down here at the bottom that we're looking here at lowered species richness when it comes to urban areas, yet high bird abundance. And what I mean by that is that if you go out into your urban area and you see a ton of bird species, you might be thinking, you know, or just a ton of birds in general, you might be thinking, well, it seems like the birds are doing great. They're, they're doing wonderful. I don't understand the concern, you know, why we're so concerned about urbanization. But really you have to hone in and look and think about the birds that you were seeing. So again, going back to those generalists and specialist species, you might be seeing, you know, a high, um, a high amount of these generalist species like cardinals and American robins, but you may be seeing somewhat of a lower amount when it comes to your specialist species like the Carolina wrens that I mentioned. So something to think about the next time you're out in your urban area walking in your park um, or what have you, um, when you're looking at the bird species that you encounter. So again, going back to urban influence and that quote that I keep placing and pulling here, urbanization, um, ultimately there's, you know, there's a high human population. So with this high human population, what we're doing is um, urban infrastructure is increasing. So urban infrastructure, what we mean by this is impervious surface. So these are like your roads and your sidewalks. That's increasing with construction as well as artificial light and anthropogenic noise pollution. And with both of these things combined, what we will tend to find are these species specific responses, which goes back and relates to those generalist versus specialist species, which I'll get more towards to, which I'll talk about more towards the end when I um, talk about my master's work. So what have some studies um, looked at or shown when it comes to urban noise and light pollution and uh, bird responses? So first I'll talk about migration. So Again, I'm really excited to be here this evening and you know giving this talk because we are in migration, you know, season. Birds are migrating. Um, you know, you might be seeing in your uh, bird groups, um, you know, that people are advocating for you know uh, businesses and buildings to turn out their lights in order to help birds migrate. Well, there has been a ton of studies done um, in order to show how migration is impacted by light pollution. So this is one of my favorite studies. Um, this study, high intensity urban light installation dramatically alters nocturnal bird migration. This study um, specifically was done at the uh, National September 11th Memorial at their museum's tribute in light in New York City. And so basically what this study did was they wanted to observe these birds behaviors when this light was illuminated and when the light was turned off. 
So as you can imagine, when the light was illuminated, they saw that the birds aggregated in high densities, and they also saw that the birds decreased their flight speeds, they circled, and they increased their vocalizations. So the opposite was found when these lights were turned off. Um, the birds went back to normal. They were just fine. And so it shows in this study, when you get into more deeper detail, it shows, you know, the high impact that um, that light pollution is having on migrating birds, but not just on migrating birds. We also saw earlier, you know, that other species that migrate like bats and turtles, it's affecting them in the same way. But another study looked at the influence of light pollution um, and urbanization on body size, condition, and physiology of um, juvenile birds. So what this study did was they looked at two different sites. So one site was um, a forested area and one site was a sort of more urban area. And they wanted to compare these two sites and their findings when it came to the body size and condition of these species of birds. So they looked at two different things. They looked at tarsus length, so the leg of the birds. They looked at tarsus length and they looked at body mass or the weight of the birds. And ultimately what they found was that the birds in um, the more urban areas had reduced body mass and body size. And they also found that these birds had a significant difference in their fat scores. Whereas the opposite was was found in the forested areas where the birds, you know, their body size was just right, their body mass was just right, um, and their fat scores were just right as well. So this study set out to sort of show, you know, another way that light pollution is impacting bird species when it came to their body size, condition, and physiology and health. And so this study did compare sparrows, so that was the species that they compared. So I've talked about light pollution and have pulled some studies when it relates to light pollution, but now I'll sort of move into noise pollution and what some studies have found when it comes to noise. So when it comes to noise pollution and birds, we have this thing called circadian rhythms. We, we have it as people, um, animals have it. Circadian rhythms are basically how we live our lives. It's a natural internal process that regulates our sleep-wake cycle. And so for organisms out in the wild, circadian rhythms serve as an environmental cue for many, many, many organisms. So as you can imagine, loud noises from us people in urban areas are severely impacting animal circadian rhythms. So just like we would be, you know, severely impacted by loud noise, you know, you know, woken up at night, our sleep cycle is off, the same thing happens with um, animals in the wild, especially birds. So with their circadian rhythms, this sort of, you know, this allows them to sort of, you know, this controls their breeding behaviors, you know, reproduction, et cetera, when they go to forage. And so, as you can imagine, noise pollution is having a severe impact on their circadian rhythms. So one example for noise pollution in birds, but another example, and this is a very common example that you'll see in the literature as well, is that noise pollution is essentially um, causing, bird, well, yeah, causing birds to sort of alter their singing and communication. So this specific study, Birdsong and Anthropogenic Noise, Vocal Constraints May Explain Why Birds Sing Higher Frequency Songs in Cities. So this was a very interesting study which looked at common blackbirds. So if we look at the um, chart down here in the bottom left, we'll see two lines. So our green line represents our forested area and our blue line represents our city. So this study, again, looked at the difference um, in observations between a forested area and a city area. So as you can see at the beginning, I mean, it's quite normal here. We see that the birds in the forested area are singing like they should, same as the birds in the city. But as our frequency here increases, we start to see that our city birds are singing much, much higher than our forested birds. So basically what this study found was that these common blackbirds in cities, they vocalized with a higher frequency and amplitude than blackbirds in forested areas. So why was this the case? Well, by singing at higher frequencies, these birds were able to reduce acoustic masking by low frequency traffic noise. So essentially, these birds had to ultimately change their vocalizations in order to sing and communicate over this high noise um, that we are bringing into the city as humans with our traffic, with our construction, etc. So um, 
not just common blackbirds, but other species have been shown to be able to alter their vocalizations. But we'll see here, again, when I talk about my master's work, some, some birds are not as fortunate, if you will. But so far, with both noise and light pollution, I have sort of talked about the negative effects, if you will. And I think sometimes we as scientists and researchers love to focus more on those negative effects. And we sort of love to, you know, that's sort of what we like to hone in on. That's sort of what we want to, you know, um, you know, provide our audience members with when we write our papers and stuff. We want, we think that the negative will sort of bring in, you know, more traction. But you also have to think about the positive effects and you have to you know, report on those too. So, especially when it comes to light pollution, some studies have found that light pollution can be beneficial to some species. So for example, with our raptors, so our owls you know, that hunt at night, light pollution can you know, benefit them to essentially be able to see their prey well at night. Although owls have great, you know, great eyes and great eyesight, light pollution sort of, you know, they, they, they have an advantage, uh, an additional advantage when it comes to light pollution. Another study, Senzaki et al, 2020, um, found that a specific species, so American robins, they found that American robins actually use light pollution to their um, advantage in the morning times in order to forage earlier, et cetera. Um, and especially, and I'll talk about this later on also, but especially when it comes to American robins, if you're ever for any reason, if you like wake up in the middle um, and like in the morning around like maybe three, four, 5 a.m. and you hear birds singing, most likely it might be American robins. <laughs> there has been a ton of studies um, which have shown, in fact, that American robins has sort of figured this whole light pollution, noise pollution thing out. And they'll sort of wake up early in the morning, start singing early in the mornings, forage early in the mornings in order to basically beat that traffic noise out, um, which has ultimately, you know, brought much success to this species and essentially is why you might see more American robins in your urban areas. I know down here in Raleigh, I see them everywhere all the time. So again, they have this whole urbanization thing down packed. But again, that's our generalist species and they're more easily able to adapt to these urban impacts. So what are some other results of urbanization that we might see in urban areas? So there's predation. Um, <laughs> so do not get an urban ecologist started on outdoor cats. They will talk your head off about why outdoor cats, you know, are essentially bad. And I, I agree with them. Outdoor cats are probably one of the top reasons why, um, top reasons for bird mortalities in urban areas. So if you know anybody who may have an outdoor cat, you know, sort of maybe educate them on why outdoor cats need to be controlled um, when it comes to our bird populations in order for our bird populations to um, ultimately thrive more. Um, and then as well, we also have uh, raptors in that you know, might be in the, in the city, so falcons, et cetera, if you will. Um, they can be in the city too, and these birds will sort of prey on you know, smaller birds um, in the city, but again, they're not so much as responsible for bird mortalities as cats are, but you know, they can, they can, they can, they can cause sort of, they can pack a punch when it comes to um, mortality rates um, in our bird species in urban areas. Another thing is species richness. So we've touched on this before, going back to the whole species richness thing with the generalist and specialist species. So we might be seeing, you know, lower amounts of species richness in our urban areas due to what, you know, our urban areas have become. So anything from, you know, uh, nesting habitats, so like where birds can nest, to their food supply, which is the other example that I have here, all of this sort of determines what sort of birds we are going to see in our urban areas. So again, touching back on food supply, I mentioned the pesticides. Again, that's another you know, thing that we have to consider. So even around our own homes and stuff, we want to try to limit the use of pesticides. Um, I do know, you know that business buildings and stuff, even housing developments, when they want to plant these you know, nice flowers and whatnot, um, they will use you know, pesticides to sort of you know, control that. But again, we sort of want to limit our use on pesticides for food, the food supply and insect sake, which will ultimately benefit our bird species. Okay, so now to the very, very fun stuff. <laughs> so um, 
throughout the rest of the slides here, I'm going to sort of be discussing my uh, master's research and what I did as a master's student. Now, this research, I am currently working towards getting it published. Um, when you work with co-authors, that's, you know, a whole thing you have to consider, you know, getting everything to their standards and getting all their, their suggestions, you know, implemented. So it's been a while, <laughs> but I'm getting ready to submit to publication. So once I have that, I can certainly pass it off, um, you know, to you all to view um, on a later day at your convenience. But um, until then, I'll sort of briefly go through my master's thesis, because if I were to go through it all, we would be here for another 30 minutes. So I sort of dimmed it down to where I could still get my point across um, on what I researched and what I found. So essentially what I did was I took data from the Citizen Science Project Neighborhood Nest Watch. So a 20 year data set, they let me use 20 years of their data, which I'll get more into in the next slide. And I looked at the survival rates of adult songbirds in relation to anthropogenic noise and light along an urban to rural gradient. So my overall objective was to use this 20 years of data in order to estimate the apparent annual survival of seven different bird species, which I'll introduce to you later on, in relation to light pollution, noise pollution, and impervious surface. So I specifically focused on light pollution and noise pollution, but impervious surface was just automatically there because it was ultimately a factor that sort of contributed to the responses that I got from these different birds. So impervious surface plays a huge role in these birds, you know, species specific responses. So again, impervious surface, our roads, sidewalks, et cetera. So my overall prediction was that even urban adapted species would experience some sort of reduced adult survival when it came to light pollution, noise pollution, um, and or impervious surface. So although I have discussed that, you know, generalist species, you know, they can sort of adapt very well to urban areas, I still predicted that there would be some sort of factor in there that would um, reduce their adult survival, if you will. So first I'll talk about Neighborhood Nest Watch. So what is Neighborhood Nest Watch? I'm sure some of you might have heard about Neighborhood Nest Watch, but it is a citizen science project, which um, is based out of the Smithsonian Zoo, um, specifically the Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center um, hosts this project. And so again, it's a citizen science project used to determine the influence of human built environments on bird populations. So if you have heard of the term citizen science, Basically what this is, is it allows for everyday people, everyday participants to sort of interact with scientists and researchers and help them, you know, with their, with their data, with their study, help them collect their data. And this is beneficial in both ways for the researcher as well as the participant. For the researcher, it allows them to sort of, you know, collect this big, you know, amount of data that they might not could have collected on their own, but with the use of different participants in the study, they are able to. And then on the participant side, it allows them to be engaged more in scientific studies, to learn more about the scientific process, to learn more about the human impact on wildlife. It helps, you know, do all of that while helping the participants sort of become an advocate for whatever, you know, project or study they're helping the researcher with. So specifically for this study, participants help scientists um, understand how successfully different species are surviving across a range of environments that are impacted by people. So the study was based in Washington, DC. Um, and specifically the participants would sort of, um, they would give the scientists, they would recite the birds, if you will. So what these scientists did was when they captured these birds, they when they captured these birds and got all their scientific measurements or whatever they needed, they would band them, they would color band them and release them. So the participants job was to whenever they would recite these birds, they would collect this data and give it back to the scientists um, in charge of the project. And that's how this sort of 20 year data set came about with this band recite data. So again, um, neighborhood, Nest neighborhood Nest Watch's um, ultimate goal is to study, to study the effects of rapid development on wildlife and while also educating citizens, hint the term citizen science, about the scientific process and human impacts on wildlife. So just a brief overview of Neighborhood Nest Watch and where my data came from. So an introduction to my seven different focal species. So again, I was looking at these specific seven focal species and um, looking at how their survival was impacted by urban noise, 
light pollution and impervious surface. So from left to right here, we have the lovely American Robin, the song sparrow, Northern Cardinal, gray cat bird, house wren, Carolina chickadee, and Carolina wren. And these are the seven focal species that Neighborhood Nest Watch usually um, works with in their data set when they're looking at these um, avian survival. And they also study avian reproduction and the, the effects of urbanization on reproduction as well. But my research was just specifically focused on survival and not reproduction. So Again, if I were to talk about my old master's thesis and what I did and all the models that I ran, et cetera, we would be here for probably another 30 minutes. So I'm just gonna get right to the nitty gritty and just sort of explain what I found and why you know, I believe I got the results that I did. So essentially, going back to what I was explaining about the species specific responses when it came to our generalist and our specialist species, the results that I got were the exact same. I saw that some birds responded well to light pollution and noise pollution, and some birds did or did not. And so my sort of overall job was to specifically try to go through and explain, well, why is, why is this happening? Why do I think, you know, that certain birds are, you know, responding the way that they are? So I hit the literature and I sort of related it back to natural history traits and life history theory, which I will get into in the next few slides. So I specifically said that these responses that I got when it came to light and noise pollution may relate to variation in natural history traits producing species specific responses. So essentially what I mean by that is I pulled a few examples of um, some of my seven focal species. So I have three here. So the first one, when it came to light pollution, overall, I found that American robins responded very well to light pollution. So essentially what I found in literature is sort of what I discussed earlier. Um, light pollution has been determined to affect the singing behaviors of several species, uh, especially the American robin. So again, literature has found that American robins will sort of will sort of wake up early, very, very early, and they will start singing. They will start singing and you know foraging earlier. And so again, they have the whole urbanization thing down pat when it comes to American robins. So their, so their response to light pollution did not surprise me one bit. But then when we look at noise pollution, um, for two of my species specifically, the gray cat bird and the um, song sparrow, I saw that they really didn't respond very well when it came to noise pollution. So I went back in the literature and, um, you know, essentially, it essentially said that anthropogenic sound may mask bird song, particularly notes which occur at low frequencies. So going back to that example that I had pulled about the common blackbirds, we saw that they were able to easily adapt and adjust their frequencies, their pitch, if you will. Um, they were able to adjust all of those elements in their song in order to overcome noise pollution. However, like I had stated, you know, some species may not be, you know, that lucky and may not, cannot easily adapt when it comes to noise pollution and changing their frequencies, if you will. They might can change them, but they may not, they may not can change them to where it's, you know, a huge impact. So for these two species, I saw in the literature that, you know, when it came to their song, a lot of their songs are sung at very low frequencies. So these two species very well might have had, you know, a harder time to adjust to the impacts of noise pollution and sort of, you know, again, you know, altering their songs in order to overcome noise pollution. So this was essentially um, what I had proposed as to why I had got the responses of these two species that I did. But ultimately, also, I bring in life history theory. Now, again, this is another one of those things where if you would like to learn more about life history theory, I would highly suggest you, you know, look it up online, go on Google Scholar, you know, go on, you know, scholarly sources in order to sort of understand what life history theory is. Because at first I did not, <laughs> I was, I was talking to my advisor and I was like, wait, like what, like, what is this? But so I'll try to break it down in the simplest terms that I can. So basically life history theory states that organisms experience constraints between growth or survival and reproduction. So essentially, we have organisms, which is represented in the image um, to the right here. So 
we have reproduction, we have growth, and we have our trade-offs, which is represented by the red line with these circles. And we have this small blue circle at the very top there that's described as the immortal and highly fecund organism. And essentially what this chart is trying to describe is that there is a trade-off between reproduction and growth. So this idea of this ideal, immortal, and high fecund organism does not exist, which essentially says that there is no, no organism on earth that has a high survival and a high reproduction. It just does not exist. So it has to be either or, which means some organisms might put in more time and energy to survival, which means less time for reproduction. And some organisms might put in more time for reproduction and which means less time for survival. So it's either or, it cannot be both, which is where we get this trade-off from this life history trade-off. So again, this organism does not exist because it means that this organism would live forever and produce many rounds of offsprings, which we know is not true because everything dies. So essentially there's no organism on earth <laughs> that is this immortal and highly fecund organism. So just to give you some real life examples here, we have um, an albatross on the left and just your basic duck on the right. So species of albatross, they have a very long lifespan, but they have low reproduction, which essentially shows us that they put all this time and energy into you know, living and surviving, which means they have less time to put into their reproduction. Whereas with the duck, it's the exact opposite. So ducks have a very short lifespan, but they have very high reproduction. Ducks are reproducing very, very, you know, ever so often. So with that, they have a shorter lifespan, but they put high amounts of energy in their reproduction. So life history trade-off, just like, you know, this that scale that I have there pictured, you just have to think of it as, you know, either high reproduction, low survival, or high survival and low reproduction. It's either or, it cannot be both. So essentially I took this theory and put it towards my research. And this was the ultimate theory that I um, sort of um, used as a way to explain why I thought my bird species responded the way that they did, which goes back to those species specific responses that I discussed earlier. Species, whether they're a generalist or a specialist species, depending on their life history and their natural history, it is ultimately going to determine um, how they respond, particularly when it comes to urbanization as a factor. It's going to ultimately determine how these bird species respond in these urban areas. So putting life history theory with my research, again, it assumes a trade-off between survival and reproduction. So I basically stated that if artificial light and anthropogenic sounds are stressors that negatively affect reproduction, then it's possible that these birds compensate with a higher survival. And as with the opposite, if artificial light and anthropogenic sound are stressors that negatively affect survival, then it is possible that birds compensate with higher reproduction. So again, if you want to learn more about life history theory, I highly suggest you go on Google Scholar and just look up life history theory. There's tons of papers there that can explain it to you. Um, but I hope, I hope I sort of explained it in a way that makes sense. So I always think of it as that trade-off, higher survival, low reproduction, um, and you know, just that switch. So ultimately, I wanted to sort of end this presentation a little bit with some good news. So earlier I had discussed, you know, migration and all of these calls to, you know, turn out the lights in order to help birds as they migrate. So I want to shout out my two favorite cities, Raleigh, North Carolina, which I reside in right now, and Charlotte, North Carolina, which I um, was, I grew up right outside of Charlotte. So Charlotte is like my you know, my other home <laughs> away from Raleigh. So with both of these, um, there have been initiatives in order to sort of turn out the lights in order to help birds migrate. So Raleigh was actually the first major city um, in the state to commit to this initiative. So go Raleigh. And then um, Charlotte is, um, it says right here, you know, that they're really encouraging that even the Duke Energy Center, one of the city's most iconic buildings, um, is turning out its lights for birds. So that, you know, is a huge, a huge thing. And um, it gets me really, really excited because it's showing that these initiatives when it comes to migration and birds are really, really taking, you know, taking flight, if you will. And there's been changes that are being and continuously being implemented. So again, I just wanted to give a shout out to my two favorite cities. Um, 
But last but not least, I wanted to sort of leave you all with some light pollution solutions as well as noise pollution fixes. Now, I will say that the light pollution solutions are much easier to talk about than the noise pollution. Um, so I always get questions all the time from people, well, what can I do, you know, in order to help out the animals, to help out the environment, um, be environmentally friendly, et cetera. So again, I like talking about the light pollution solutions. Noise pollution solutions sort of get into, you know, government and policies, sort of like the higher up, you know, higher up on the, on the, um, you know, on the charts, if you will. So, but I'll still sort of talk about what they have been doing as far as noise pollution. But when it comes to light pollution, some things that we can do is we can switch to LEDs and compact fluorescence. This, you know, reduces the, the energy that's being, you know, um, that's being emitted um, in the environment. We can make sure to turn off lights indoors when not in use. So if you're not using a light indoors, go ahead and turn it off. Motion sensor lights are a big one. So instead of having lights that are on all the time, you can use motion sensor lights that are only on for a short period of time and you know turn off a bit later. And then outdoor light fixtures that shield the light source. So I know in a ton of you know neighborhoods and stuff, we have a ton of you know lights and light fixtures going up and down sidewalks because essentially we have to see at night. I mean, that's a no-brainer. We have to see at night, but there are um more um, environmentally friendly ways like, um, you know, uh, implementing and adding a shield to that light source in order to um, help shield out that light source in order for it not to be, you know, emitted everywhere. So um, again, also going back to like the buildings essentially. So, you know, big name buildings and office buildings, if you will, you know, billboards even, all of these things are illuminated at night. And if nobody's in them, especially the buildings, if nobody's in them, there's no reason for any lights in the buildings to be on. So um, again, it just depends on, you know, the, what state you're in. Some states have made this change. Some states are working towards it. Um, so it just all depends. But these are some simple things that we can do as humans in order to help our environment and our bird, um, our bird friends. And then um, touching on noise pollution fixes, again, this is sort of more up there kind of governmental fixes, you know, if you will. But um, so there has been talk, I actually read a study the other day that um, was saying that, you know, alternative practices are being um, sort of visited in order to dampen the noise associated with offshore wind farms, um, as well as like passing boats in the sea, you know, so noise pollution, it highly, highly affects, there's been many studies that which have shown that noise pollution affects our marine life. Um, so anything that happens in, you know, the ocean, there's been sort of talk on ways that we could sort of reduce that noise pollution in order to help out our marine life. Um, and there's also sound barriers along highways that, you know, that, that, you know, the, the, they will, they will have up for, you know, in order to reduce um, sound. Um, so we'll see those along highways. And there's also, I had read somewhere like, you know, depending, depending on who it is, like when they sort of set out to build, you know, housing developments and such, they can actually bring someone in to sort of, um, you know, monitor and survey, you know, the amount of noise that's coming. And they have some ways in which they can sort of implement some things in order to help that noise pollution. So Again, I love to talk about the light pollution solutions. I think those are much easier for us to, you know, to, to implement in order to help our, our wildlife. Um, but I just wanted to touch on the noise pollution stuff and sort of um, let you know what's being done as far as noise pollution. So my resource list, again, I'm sure that these links have been passed um, through the chat, but um, I'll also pass these off um, to the team and they could probably save these for you all and get them to you um, if you want to visit them uh, at your convenience. But this is just sort of um, giving you some more resources. So like a blog post that I have on urban noise and light pollution, a little bit more about neighborhood nest watch, um, talking about SciGlow and community science um, on the American Birding podcast that I did with them. Uh, talking about the pandemic and citizen science, and that sort of goes into, you know, what citizens, what people were doing, you know, during the pandemic and how citizen science had an impact on that. So if you want to learn more about citizen science, that's there. Um, and then those two links for those articles about um, Raleigh 
and Charlotte dimming the lights are there for you as well if you want to hear more. Um, also, Georgia Audubon, they have a wonderful and big initiative, you know, going on about turning out the lights for migrating birds. So I highly suggest that you um, visit them as well. And so with that, that is the end <laughs> of my presentation. I tried not to go too long as, you know, I wanted to have some time for questions if there were any questions, but I hope you guys enjoyed it. Again, I appreciated, I appreciate you coming out this evening to spend your time, you know, with us this evening and learning more about urban noise and light pollution. So if you took away one thing from this presentation, that means I did my job right. <laughs> so um, if you ever want to contact me, feel free to reach out. My email is here, my website, if you want to learn more about my work and what I do. And if you want to follow me on social media, feel free. My Instagram and my Twitter handle is there, um, at LDFAR, P-H-A-R-R. Um, and yeah, so again, I thank you for listening and I will hand it back over to the team. So thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for the presentation. That was really um, great to have you share your knowledge and especially get some kind of the um, things that we can do to help the birds, especially. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Um, so maybe to kind of drive that um, point home a little bit, uh, we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, yeah. And if folks have more questions, make sure you add them there. But I had a question, uh, or maybe just sort of, maybe you could expand on highlighting a little bit. Um, at least to me, it's sort of counterintuitive that a lot of this bird migration, if you see the kind of maps of bird migration, really happens in the middle of the night. Can you, um, and that's why the light pollution is such a big deal, right? Can you talk right. a little bit about sort of why that is? Why are the birds um, active at that time of the day? Or why are they choosing to move these huge distances at that time? Yeah, so that is actually a good question. And you know what? It's uh, actually... It's actually, I'm glad you asked that because it's actually something that I'm, I myself am trying to like research and figure out and actually ask other people. Like I, so I kid you not, that is an excellent question that I wish I could answer, but I'm actually <laughs> trying to, I'm actually trying to figure that out myself because I had the same, I had the same kind of, kind of, you know, thing like, okay, well, why, why are they, you know, why are they doing this? So, <laughs> so I'm sorry I couldn't right? answer it, but. <laughs> I am, I am looking into talking to other people and getting their opinions as to why they think it's happening. So Sure, sure. I mean, yeah, <laughs> one of those mysteries maybe that we don't it know is, an answer to, right? It is. It really is. It really is a mystery. <laughs> maybe when we uh, learn to speak bird, we'll figure it out. But yes. Until then, <laughs> yeah. um, let's see. We had a couple of questions coming into the chat now. Uh, so I'll start off the top here. A question from Gary about other uh, emission effects on uh, wildlife, like in terms of, there's a question about carbon monoxide. Um, have there been studies there as far as, you know, obviously carbon dioxide, and methane, and these other things are affecting the environment in general, but are they affecting wildlife specifically? Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And that's actually a good question. So thank you for that. Um, so it all goes back to pollution, right? So, I mean, not just from, you know, our cars, but like, you know, recycling, et cetera, like all of these things we sort of have to, you know, watch out for, um, especially like you're talking about vehicle emissions that gets into our air pollution and our air quality. And just like, it's not good for us, it's not good for, you know, our wildlife either. Um, so I, I'm sure that there have been studies that have looked more closely at that. Um, but as far, when we go back to, you know, urbanization, that's a huge thing, right? We have all these vehicles. Um, so, you know, not just with, you know, noise pollution, but all, like, like you're saying, all these vehicles are coming in, you know, emitting, you know, this, all the CO2 and everything into the air. And it's just all this exhaust and it's not, it's, it's not good for anybody. So yes, for sure, wildlife are impacted by those exhausts. So that is a wonderful question. Mm -hmm. Great. Then let's see, we have an anonymous uh, question about uh, light pollution and whether it affects birds during their non-migration time. So, you know, when they're migrating, obviously it's affecting them at night, but are they, is it affecting them at other times of the year too? Um, and maybe talk a little bit about the mechanism for that if so. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, so if, I, if I understand correctly, so the, you're wanting to know how light pollution affects birds during their non-migration period? Right, I mean, I guess it, it, it makes sense that if there's a lot of lights on at night and the birds are flying over in the middle of the night, then they're being put off course or something by that. But yes, is the, the same effect there when they're just 
inhabiting a neighborhood, um, you know, living uh, in a- that's, Well, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, same effects when you're having the neighborhood. So I, I would say yes, um, because again, as like some of the studies that I have presented, um, just birds like living in a neighborhood with these, um, you know, high noise, not just noise, but in light pollution areas, um, you know, we, we see that, you know, some studies have shown that even like aside from migration, all this stuff is impacting different things, right? Like their, their health, for example, um, we saw like in those studies, it affects their physiology, which was actually the, it was the study that I was going to pursue for my master's. Um, but then, you know, some things with that happened, like the pandemic hit and there was like the whole thing about citizen science, it was sort of implemented into that project. But since the pandemic hit, I couldn't really carry out that project. So that's why I had to move to this 20 year data set um, and using that, which was still great. But um, even in my research and my literature search, again, um, you know, we see here that even when birds aren't migrating, light pollution and noise pollution still impact them in various ways from their health, um, from their, you know, chicks, chick development we saw um, from, you know, which all goes back again to like, you know, food sources and everything. So um, they're, they're calling. So their communication, there's many studies out there that have, you know, researched, um, you know, light and noise pollution and its effects on, you know, bird communications, which again, going back to that American Robin, they figured it out very, very well. I give kudos to them every single day. But um, so yes, to answer your question. Um, yes, there, there are still impacts on birds, even when they're not migrating. <laughs> um, sort of, you, you brought up the Robin again as a, um, a species that's done really well. Have, uh, has any of your research talked about crows or in our area ravens? Um, nope. So I stay I stay with the with with the passerine species. So I haven't really haven't really touched any on crows um, um, or anything like that. But we've had a few um, comments in the chat about um, crows being yeah. very adaptable, <laughs> <Yeah>. right? <laughs> Yes, I do actually, I have um, a colleague on Twitter. She studies, she studies solely crows. So she would be better to answer that question than I would. <laughs> yeah, and we've, we've talked about crows and ravens being yes. um, as adaptable as they are in a few other wild Coachella uh, lectures. Definitely yes, fascinating yes. animals. They um, are, they are. Let's see. Oh, here's a question about windmills and their effect on birds. Um, I don't know if your research has touched on that at all or if you have um, read on it enough to, to have a good opinion. Yeah. Uh, but maybe you talk about that a little bit. That's an area, and here in the Coachella Valley, we have huge wind farms that um, we worry about, effects on wildlife, certainly. Right, right, right. And that's actually a really good question. So there was a study, I don't know how recent it was, but there was actually a study that actually looked at wind farms and windmills and what they did was, cause it's, it, it causes, you know, a ton of bird mortality, like it's, you know, it's a thing. Um, but there was actually um, a study done where they took like, they painted one of the, you know, like one of the, one of the, you know, one of the little fan thing, what, what do you call it? Like the, the blades? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I was, that, it escaped me. Um, they painted one of those black, and they actually um, saw that it actually helped um, the birds when they were flying, that the birds actually noticed, you know, that, that, one, that one spot painted black and it actually deterred the birds away. Mm -hmm. um, so there has been, and, I, and now that that's been brought up, I need to look back and see where they are with that. But there, there, there has been sort of talk on how, you know, um, you know, people can use that in order to help birds, you know, as they migrate to sort of, you know, deter away from that, that windmill altogether. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, actually, and if I find, I believe I, I believe I wrote about that study somewhere. And I think that'll be really interesting if I pass that link along, if, you know, UCR ever post these links or pass them, pass them along to the participants, I'll definitely include that link in there because it's a very interesting study to look at. Sure, sure, yeah, and um, I think, I know they definitely have been posting the links that you shared in the chat, so folks yes. can follow those and um, yes. check out your website, and it sounds like some of the, the things you've written about are there, right? I checked it out for a little sure. bit. For sure, for sure. Yeah, yes. uh, let's see. I'm looking through a couple more questions, but I wanted to go back to something you mentioned about um, the citizen science or community science. Mm -hmm being a part of some of the research you wanted to pursue. Is that, you said it like didn't work out because of the pandemic? Can you yeah, talk a little bit so, about that? Is there maybe a, 
Yeah, I could tell I could totally talk about that. So <laughs> I I didn't include it in the, it was in my previous presentation that I've done, you know, of talking about noise and light, but I didn't include it in this because now that I had finished my master's work, I really wanted to hone in on that. Whereas those previous, you know, presentations, I couldn't really talk about anything because I was like, well, I'm not there yet, but this is what I'm doing. Um, but so basically what I wanted to, um, what I was going to study was still related to urban noise and light pollution, but looking at um, avian uh, physiology, avian health, if you will. Um, and so to do that, so the, the, the advisor that I'm under here at NC State, she is a huge citizen scientist. She, all her work is, you know, most of her work is based off of citizen science, but her roots are in ornithology. Um, so, but I'm one of those special cases where, although I'm in a citizen science lab, most of my work does not really does not really evolve around citizen science, although you know I hear about citizen science all the time. But for this specific project, it was going to involve um, citizen science. So just like with Neighborhood Nest Watch, how they had those participants, you know, go out and recite the birds, um, I would have had participants actually, um, you know, engage with me and help me sort of. Um, you know, sample the birds, if you will, maybe like, you know, write down measure, like recording data, mm -hmm. if you will. Um, and so, because in order to, so my focal species was the Northern Cardinal. <laughs> so, um, and so to do that, to, in order to capture, you know, these birds and, you know, take all these measurements, we do what we call mist netting. So bird banders use, you know, mist netting in order to, you know, capture the birds, do what they need to do, and then they release the birds afterwards. Um, and so in order to do this, we were actually going to miss net in these participants' backyards. And so mm. we found a way to sort of put that whole, you know, citizen science in there and sort of engage our participants with that because in order to participate with this project, they had to, you know, learn more about it and sign up and, you know, be willing to host myself and my research team out in their backyards in order to capture these birds. But however, due to COVID, because that was right when, you know, COVID was starting and things were very, very scary. Yeah. We sort of, you know, we sort of kind of put a halt to it and we were like, okay, well, there's going to be a lot of, you know, interaction with people and we don't know, you know, how that's going to go. My school had all these different protocols that we had to do. We had to like write reports to say, you know, well, why we think our research should go on and all this stuff. And we just sort of, we put a pin in it, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. And we were just kind of like, yeah, we just don't think this will be doable with what we want to do with the whole citizen science aspect. So I'm hoping that if another grad student comes along, they will be able to carry out that project because everyone was super excited about it. As you can imagine, going back to, you know, citizen science and what citizen science is all about, engaging the public, everybody was ready to be engaged. Everyone was so excited. And I was just, it crushed me to, you know, tell people that, well, hey, I don't think this is going to, you know, be able to be done right now due to the pandemic. And it just crushed me to tell everyone that. But again, I just hope that if, you know, another grad student does come along, um, you know, I just I hope that, you know, they might be able to pick up that project in the future. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hopefully. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you hear a lot of stories about research being interrupted, you know, even these like long term studies where they could, couldn't go out anymore because yes. of the pandemic. Yes. Um, yes. And in a lot of cases, uh, you know, I feel like citizen science and community science have been kind of the bright spot because people can go out on their own. They don't have to have that. Right. Right. Thing. right. But obviously, if you were going into people's backyards, that would still have. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. I agree. A hundred percent. Well, thanks for sharing that story. Oh, um, of course. Well, I'm glad yeah. you asked about it, because like I said, I was. I had so much in this presentation already and I was like, well, I really want to talk about that because it's going back to, you know, the whole health aspect and the citizen science. But I was like, uh, I might run out of time <laughs> talking about that. So, but I'm glad you asked about it. So I was still able to talk about it, although it wasn't in my presentation. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so we had a couple more questions to wrap up here. Um, one about there any cooperation between folks who are interested in um, curbing light pollution for astronomy, through being able to see the night sky. Um, and with the folks who were wanting to reduce the impacts on migrating birds, is there cooperation oh, there? I mean, should there be cooperation? So if you, I don't know if, I don't know if this would be helpful, but dark, dark sky, um, it's a, it's a citizen science project. It's a citizen science based project. And that would actually allow you to sort of, um, you know, get more interaction with the with the light at night and take measurements and stuff, if you will. So but I don't know if I don't know if that would be 
what you're looking for, but it's a good place to start if you want to be more involved with that. Um, I think it's called darksky.org, I believe. Um, yeah, that he, uh, uh, John, who asked the question, talked about yes. the Dark Sky Society, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah. International Dark Sky, yeah, that's it, that's it. So, but again, I, that, that might not be where you're leaning towards, but I think it's a good place to, you know, start if you want. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, the kinds of lights, I know if you go to the hardware store out here, at least, some of the lights you'll see will say, like, Dark Sky certified. Yes. For, like, patio sure. and stuff like that. So I assume that those same lights are going to do have the same beneficial effect. Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, they're lights that basically point down at the ground instead of pointing up at the sky, so. Yes, yes. Uh, for folks who are maybe wanting to think about changing their <laughs> outdoor decor. For sure, for sure, for sure, um, for sure. For sure. And then uh, I'll, we have one more question we can wrap up on. Um, about some birds, uh, which seem to be active maybe at certain times of day anyway, or at least we observe them at different times of day anyway, mm -hmm. like they're talking about a morning song, birds being active in the morning. Um, does that, I guess, does that relationship um, come, have any relationship to the, the noise pollution and the light pollution? Is it just kind of a, a natural part of the bird's uh, behavior or both? Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it can, it can be, it, from what I, from what I get from it, it can be both, but the research that I have um, read about, you know, in the literature, um, again, going back to American Robin, so there's been tons of research done with the European Robin, um, especially, um, and so they sort of seen, and they were looking at, you know, light and noise pollution specifically, and so they sort of, you know, saw that, you know, again, why I keep giving kudos to the American Robin, um, they sort of saw that, you know, the American Robin sort of took advantage of, you know, singing earlier in the mornings, um, foraging earlier in the mornings, because they were able to do that early in the mornings in order to avoid all of that noise pollution, um, you know, that we, you know, that we bring on as humans when it comes mm -hmm. to noise. Um, same thing with light. So that Senzaki et al. study that I had mentioned, um, they sort of, you know, saw that American robins use light to their advantage as well and was able to use that in order to forage. And with that, their like chick success was, you know, much, much higher than the, you know, other birds that they have seen. So um, I really, I, I think it, again, I think it really depends on the species. Um, I've, I've read more about American robins than any other species when it came to that. Um, but um, yeah, so, but a good, a good, a good question though. A very good question. <laughs> Great. Yes. Uh, well, that, that wraps up the questions. Yeah. Uh, and I, and I did oh. actually, um, I did want to say something. So Natasha in California, sure. she made a comment in the chat and Natasha, you're absolutely right. And when I was, when I was speaking about that, I meant to speak about that. I didn't put it on my slide, but I totally, totally forgot. So when I was talking about the LED lights, um, specifically, um, Natasha is right that, you know, those high light intensities, it depends on the colors that you get. So um, for the LEDs, so she is absolutely right that, you know, studies um, suggest using the ones with the warmer color tones. So like the orange colors and the lower light intensity. So I meant to say that and I totally passed by that, but I'm so glad that you commented that. And I'm so glad I saw your comment. So thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. I didn't see the one in the chat. Good. Yes, yes. Um, right, and the, just the rest of the comments we have are all uh, thank you, and um, they're really appreciating the of course the of resources course. that you're sharing and the, your presentation being clear and engaging. Thank so you. thank you again for thank sharing with us um, and being here tonight. Of course. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Looks like people are leaving pretty quickly after as the presentation comes to a close. So. Um, if you have more questions, make sure to uh, follow and uh, and uh, follow Lauren on social media and through her website. And keep your eye out for the next Wild Coachella, which will be coming up next month. Other than that, uh, have a good evening and weekend and stay safe, everybody.